Hello, welcome to our presentation, Hidden in the Paint, Nelson Berry's Store. I'm Michelle Crow Dolby, the Education and Communications Manager here at Gary Melcher's Home and Studio in Falmouth, Virginia. American artist Gary Melcher's painted Nelson Berry's store around 1918, two years after he and his wife Corinne purchased their country estate, Belmont. Although his commercial base was firmly rooted in New York City, Melchers found considerable artistic inspiration at Belmont and the surrounding environment. This painting is one such example. Located down the road, about 400 yards from Belmont's front gate, the building that once housed Nelson Berry's store still stands in Falmouth and is easily recognizable. According to local legend, it was at Berry's store that locals would gather and Melchers would chat and sometimes sketch them. The thick, heavily impastoed paint, service, paint surface of Nelson Berry's store is characteristic of many of Melcher's late works. Here it serves to recreate the shimmering atmosphere of a bright sunny day in Virginia. Perry Hurt is a paintings conservator with the North Carolina Museum of Art who received his BFA in painting and printmaking and subsequent conservation studies from Virginia Commonwealth University. To understand the paint is to understand the artist. And Perry is one of the foremost experts of Melcher's paintings, having worked on more than 30 of his paintings during the past 30 years. Uh, as a reminder, participants are encouraged to submit questions or comments in the Q&A and chat sections at the bottom of your screen. I'm now gonna turn the program over to our speaker, Perry Hurt. Thanks, Perry. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much. Well, it's really nice to be here with you today and with everybody else. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope you'll enjoy uh, today's talk and find it interesting. Um, and uh, to get the ball rolling, I'm going to jump right in um, and, and ask you about this larger image that you see on the screen here. This is a detail from within the painting of Nelson Berry's store. And just rhetorically speaking, I'm going to ask you, where, where do, what do you think, which part of the painting is this? What are we seeing here in this detail image? And while you're thinking about that, I'm just going to point out that, um, as you can see in this detail, Gary Melcher's painted in a very rapid, loose style here. Uh, the paint's very fluid. There's some high impasto, some other very thin areas. There's even some areas where there's no paint at all. We can see kind of the white ground layer that he applied to the canvas. And this type of painting that we're seeing here is, is this prototypical impressionist painting, quick, rapid, uh, eschewing from details altogether, just really a, a, a suggestion of what you're seeing. And that's, that's where the word impressionism comes from. So, so just to be clear, this is the way Gary Melcher's painted in a large part of his career, but not his whole career. And we're gonna see some more of that in just a minute. So uh, to, to, uh, to, to uh, uh, answer the question, this is the horse's head at the far uh, left side of the painting. This is the top of the horse's head. And we will see this again in just a few minutes. Uh, Mark, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so as Michelle uh, said, I've worked with the uh, uh, Melcher's Museum Belmont for about 30 years. And in that time, I've worked on about 30 paintings, which is a nice round kind of way of looking at it. And many of those paintings have been Gary Melcher's paintings, paintings that he made himself, but also quite a few others are by uh, his fellow artists or, or paintings that he, or artworks that he collected during his own lifetime. And we'll actually talk about some of those other paintings in uh, upcoming talks, if you'd like to join us again. Uh, but to get back to Melcher's, yes, I have worked on a lot of Melcher's paintings. It's been a, it's really been a joy to work with Joanna Catron, the curator, and and this great collection at uh, Belmont. It's it's really incredible to see such a, a a width and breadth of work by one artist and get to know an artist so well. Um, so uh, a lot of things I'll be talking about today are kind of referring to the group of paintings as a whole. But Nelson Berry store is a very good example of the way Gary Mel Melcher's painted for much of his life. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the great things about the collection there is that almost all of his uh, Gary Melcher's studio materials are still in the collection. And this is really just a gold mine for someone in my profession. You rarely come across such a, 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 a diverse and deep uh, collection of the materials that an artist uses. And this can give us a lot of insight 
into the way the artists worked and, and actually into the artist's time, what was available for the artist to use at that time. Next slide, please. Uh, Gary Melchers was really an exemplary artist of his day. He was academically trained. He went to school in Dusseldorf, Germany, uh, in, in kind of an old school academic vein. Um, uh, he was born about 1860 and actually French Impressionism, as we understand it, was born about the time Gary Melchers was 10 years old. And he was, he was in school at Dusseldorf at 17 and in Paris within just a couple of years after that, continuing his studies in Paris. And so by the time Gary Melchers is about 20 years old and in, in, in Paris, Impressionism had really just started gaining ground. It really started becoming a part of, of the art world that was accepted. And so Gary Melchers, being just like most other uh, young artists at the time, very adventurous, very interested in, uh, in new art forms, he absorbed this and started painting that way himself. So, so the point here being that Gary Melchers knew both worlds. He grew up in the academic tradition and then was at the avant-garde end of it with French Impressionism, and he knew his materials and techniques extremely well. Uh, I think it's a very telling comment from one of his fellow artists, a fellow American Impressionist, Child Hassam, whose tribute to Gary Melchers in 1941, he said, his work was so sound and sane and clear that even if we could come back and look at these pictures 300 years from now, we should see them just the way they are today. Well, that's a great sentiment, and I understand what he's saying because Gary's technique was very good and his materials were very good. But I'm here to tell you as a, as a professional uh, focused on the preservation of artwork, nothing stays the same. Everything uh, is affected by the environment, by time, and, and Gary Melcher's work is certainly uh, a, a, a subject to that as well. So now we're gonna look at Nelson Berry's store. So um, next slide, please. So here we are, this is what the painting looked like when I first saw it about 21 years ago. And in fact, here's an image of me on the left when I was actually working on the painting about 20 years ago. And like we said, uh, the, the, the painting is a very good example of the style, the American Impressionist style and very much the style that Gary Melcher's worked in uh, uh, for a good part of his life. Next slide, please. So as a painting conservator, uh, we have a lot of ethics and rules to follow. And one of those things is to thoroughly document an artwork before we start working on it. One is, is that we want a very good record to show uh, what a painting looked like before we change anything. But also it's a part of the process of uh, um, examining the painting, understanding the painting and diagnosing problems before we actually start trying to fix it. So here are some examples of typical photographs that we would do for almost any painting, but they're very telling in, in this respect. So what we're looking at here at the upper right is the normal light image, what we had just seen on the previous slide, but just a little smaller. And then at the upper left, we're seeing the back of the painting with light shining through it. We call this specular light. In the center, we're looking at, a, at the same painting with raking light. That is, we put all the lights to the left and the light rakes across the surface and it accentuates texture. And then on the bottom right, we are looking at the reverse side of the painting also with raking light, which once again is accentuating the texture of the back of the canvas. Now, uh, going back again, back to the upper left, the specular light uh, image here really shows us how thick or thin the painting is. The canvas on this painting is very thin. The preparation, what we call the ground layer, is also very thin. So the light just shines right through that. So the only thing that's stopping the light is more thick applications of paint. So you can really see the difference in the thickness of paint from one place to another on this painting. In the center image, this raking light image, we really get a feeling for the texture of the paint, how, how much impasto there is, how much it's sticking up off the face of the canvas. And that's very much part of the artist's technique, applying thick paint to various different areas, allowing those brush strokes and that impasto to, to stand up. But the other thing that we see here are some of the aging properties. Now we're not close enough to the painting to really identify a lot of these in this image, but still I can see where the paint has started to crack and started to curl up, the little islands of paint start curling up away from the canvas. Um, and, 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 the, and the light, this raking light, catches the edges of that and shows it very clearly. It's even more obvious at the lower right where we look at the back of the canvas. 
because if you look at this closely, you'll see certain areas that look kind of wrinkly like the surface of a raisin. And what's, what's causing that is the paint on the front where it has cracked into little islands and those islands are curling away from the canvas and it's creating this quilted quality to the back of it. So if you look on all four of these images and, on, and there's a little square superimposed at, each, at, at an upper corner, that's the same corner in all, the, all of these images. So you can really start to compare how the aging of this thick paint and its cupping distortion is pulling the canvas with it. And this is a, a relatively serious structural issue that we had to deal with during the conservation. So here, once again, we have images before the conservation work, and these are all details to show us a little bit more about the painting itself. At the upper left, we have the whole painting with the little squares superimposed on it that show you where these details come from. And each one of these details is about uh, half an inch to two inches across, just to give you a sense of scale. At the upper right, we see a detail from the upper right corner of the painting. This is the blue sky bordered by the kind of green leafy quality of the trees there. And in this image, we really get a good uh, representation of how different the paint can be that Gary's applied. The blue is applied relatively thinly. You can see uh, right through in many areas to that white ground underneath, but then the, the much more thickly applied green of the leaves and that sort of thing. In the blue, you might notice cracks and little edges that have turned up. That's the cupping distortion I'm referring to. The problem there is that um, once those cracks start and that cupping gets worse and worse and worse, eventually the whole island of paint is undermined and it can cleave right off of the painting. And that's actually what we're seeing right in the center there, just to the right of center, see a little brown area. That's the canvas. There's no paint left there. That little spot of paint has broken off of the painting. And we had a few of those across the face of the painting, not a great deal, but just a few. But that clues us into the fact that there's a lot of loose paint on this painting that needs to be anchored down. That was part of the structural work that we ultimately did on the painting. Uh, just below that at lower right is kind of an interesting uh, slide. And that is, it documents the use of varnish on the painting. Now that, that might not seem odd or unusual, but actually it is rather unusual and odd for this peri period of painting. Uh, and Gary gives us a really interesting insight here. He applied varnish only to the shutters on the building. Now why he did it only on the shutters of the building is a matter of debate. But what's not up to, for debate is that he actually applied varnish in these areas. So the, air, the, this, the detail that you're seeing, there's varnish on this whole area, but it's puddled in a brushstroke right at the center of the, of the uh, image. And right across the, uh, uh, horizontally across that, you see this kind of yellow streak. That's a puddle of the varnish where the yellowing is much more accentuated because it's a thicker area of varnish. Now, why is this important or interesting? One of the things about the Impressionists is, the French Impressionists and ultimately the American Impressionists, they chose not to use varnish or most of them chose not to use varnish. And there's several different reasons for this. One of the reasons is, is that uh, many artists before they painted, before the French Impressions painted, artists before them used varnish a great deal. They would use varnish in their paint and they would varnish their paintings after the fact. And because they had been doing this for several hundred years, the Impressionists could see that that varnish had yellowed. It goes on clear, but it becomes yellow over time. And the Impressionists did not want their bright, colorful paintings turning yellow. But there's also another reason for this, and this is much more an emotional, philosophical idea. And that is, is that the French Impressionists uh, broke a lot of rules. They, they intentionally did things very differently from the generation before them. And in their minds, in their hearts, they felt like varnish was something that the previous generation used, but not their generation. It was a very deep-seated feeling that they had that varnish should not be used. Um, so it's interesting that, that Gary applies varnish here, and it's something that as a painting conservator and as an art historian, we want to note this and to keep it at all, at, at, if at all possible, because it really shows us that uh, um, Gary Melcher's had his foot in both worlds. He painted as an Impressionist, as the French Impressionists had shown the world how to paint, but he also saw the use of varnish in certain instances. So it's, it's very interesting that he chose to use it in this spot. And at the lower left here, we, hit, we see that same detail we saw in the very first slide of our presentation today. And once again, this is the, the head of the horse. 
And the reason I have this here is once again, just to, to show us the uh, variety of brush stroke, the variety of the thickness and thinness of paint. But also just to note that the, the, the horse's head is actually quite white. There's a little bit of yellow mixed into it, but it's very white. And you can see in the slide that it just looks gray. And that's a good indication of just how dirty this painting was. Um, uh, a lot of the paintings, uh, most of the paintings in, in uh, the Melcher's collection in, at Belmont have had very little restoration to them. Um, especially Gary's paintings that are, are largely untouched by restoration. And so uh, nothing has been done to them since they were originally painted. So at this point, this painting is 80 years old. And this gives us just an idea of, of how dirty a painting can get in 80 years without any kind of uh, intervention by restoration, that sort of thing. Next slide, please. So here we have uh, a during cleaning photograph at the upper right, and then the finished painting at, at, at lower, uh, excuse me, lower right, and the during cleaning at upper left. Um, for the treatment, I'm not, I'm not showing you a lot of steps. There were a lot of steps in the treatments of this painting. A lot of it was the structural work. I had to do a, quite a bit of uh, anchoring that loose paint, as we were talking about. I also did some structural work to reduce planar distortions, that cupping distortion that we saw in the paint and the canvas, I reduced that to a certain amount. But largely visually, it was just about cleaning this painting. Now this is just removing dust and grime. I did not affect the varnish that was on the painting. And you see that in the upper left here in this during cleaning image, the left side of the painting has been cleaned and I reserved one little square in the sky at the upper left. But that really shows you just how dramatically different this painting uh, looked after cleaning. Um, of course, in, in, in the idea of restoration, you're trying to get back to what the painting originally looked like as much as possible. In this case, I think we've, we've done that uh, very well. That's not always possible because a lot of things change over time and they're irreversible. But in this case, we're just talking about a simple uh, dirt layer, removing that and really getting back to the original colors that, that Gary showed us in this, in this painting. So that's my presentation for today, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. So Perry, I am stunned at how how much the just the cleaning of the painting changed the appearance. How how do you go about cleaning? Uh, cleaning is always it's it's a very it's always very specific to the artwork. Um, it's the, the there's a euphemism about our business is called separation technology. And that is, we're trying to remove something without affecting what's underneath of it. So we don't wanna affect the painting in any way, shape or form, if at all possible. Um, one of the most um, strongest ethics that we have in our field is not to do any harm, very much like the medical field. We don't wanna do anything that's irreversible to the painting. We don't wanna change the painting. Um, so we wanna remove dust, grime, that sort of thing and leave the painting untouched. In this case, it was really quite simple. Uh, I, I cleaned it with water in a very controlled way. The water also had a few other things added to it, surfactants, chelating agents, uh, various th different things like that. And it al also had to be rinsed effectively to remove those materials that were in the water. But uh, in this case, this, uh, Gary's painting was very forgiving as far as cleaning goes. It is a bit of a trick. Uh, cleaning a painting that has as much texture as this painting does uh, to get down in the texture of the brush strokes and things to clean it evenly. But the other thing is you don't want that water to go through and soak the canvas because um, uh, you could easily get shrinkage and other problems that would affect the canvas if you let it get too wet. So it has to be done in a very controlled way. Um, the other thing is, is that we, you know, since we're talking about the varnish, oftentimes when we talk about cleaning a painting, we're also talking about removing varnish. In most cases, well, I won't say most cases, in many cases, the varnish is put on after the painting is done. It may not even be applied by the artist. It might be applied by somebody a year or, or many years later um, to make the painting look a certain way or to protect the painting. And oftentimes that varnish ages, as we saw before, it can turn yellow or gray, that sort of thing, and it ages. And that oftentimes uh, should be removed as well. And that needs to be re removed with solvents. It's a very different kind of a cleaning process. But it is, in the case of this painting, there was no varnish to remove. And actually, I went to great pains to make sure to uh, keep the varnish that does exist on this painting. So I was quite certain that this was a varnish that the artist applied. Hmm. 
We have um, a question for you, Perry. Um, it says the this work seems incredibly detailed, your work. Uh, how long can a conservator work on a painting without a break? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> 15 minutes, 50 minutes, just depends on how long before I get hungry, that sort of thing. But um, <laughs> Uh, the way I work, and I, I think a lot of people work this way in, in almost any profession, you can only do focused uh, um, work for, for a short period of time. You simply can't work on something very detailed for hours and hours and hours. It's, it's, it's uh, your, your edge wears down and you, and you become sloppy or just not as attentive as you were when you, when you first beginning. So doing very detailed work, I only do that for an hour or two a day. And I mean, probably wouldn't even do that straight because there's always something else that needs to be done. Writing reports, taking photographs, uh, uh, building boxes to carry artwork in, just all sorts of the things that we do in our, in our business. We do a lot of communication. We do a lot of research. Uh, before we touch a painting, we, we, we don't know anything about the artist or the era that the painting is, is made. We, we try to educate ourselves a bit more because there can be so many ins and outs about different, the way different artists work or, or the different times that they work in. So there's a lot of things that go into being a painting conservator or a conservator for any kind of artwork. And so the actual hands-on work uh, is, is, is generally only a smaller percentage of that larger job. And so you can interspace and break up your day and you're not quite so focused on just getting one task done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you uh, normally have several paintings that you're working on at the, at the same time or do you take it um, one painting? At a time, it, 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 that varies a great deal. Uh, uh, today, I would say that I only, if I have one painting going at a time, that would be great because I do so much other bureaucracy and, and other things at my job now. Uh, say 15, 20 years ago, when, when I was really doing a lot of uh, painting conservation work, working on Belmont's paintings, things like that, I would routinely have three or four going at one time because invariably, um, uh, like I say, some of the work was very detailed. You can only do that for so much time. Other work was less detailed. There's certainly times when things need to dry before you can do anything else. If, if I do apply a varnish to a painting before I do my retouching and things, that varnish has to sit for several days to make sure it's good and dry uh, before I start applying my paint. And there's many other steps within the treatment that are similar to that. So it's, it's, it's much more efficient to have several paintings going on at the same time. Is it hard uh, to switch between the different paintings if they're of different artists? Because um, as someone asks, because you, you're not working with the same paint box? Uh, sure, it, 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 there can be a problem with that. And it's, it's um, in a lot of ways, your training boils it down to certain steps. And, and it, while, while paintings can be very different from, from each other, a lot of times the, the problems are the same. The problems that they have are very similar. Um, so um, I, I've really had a problem with forgetting which painting I was working on when I was actually working on it and getting my materials mixed up or anything like that. But it's, it's, it's always the case when, you, when, when I sit down to work in a painting that I haven't messed with for a week or a month or something like that, I, I do refresh my, my, my thoughts. I, I keep log notes of everything I do for an artwork. It's just my personal notes so I know what step I've just done and, and what type of varnish I may or may not have applied or what my adhesive was because those are all choices that are specific to that specific artwork. And so the next step is always following about what I had done before and, and what, what uh, different steps coexist correctly together. So, you know, it's, you have to be careful, but this is a business about being careful. And we're, we're trained to be careful from the very beginning. All right. So Edward wants to know, of the 30 paintings you've worked on at Belmont, which one was the most challenging? Most challenging? Well, that's interesting. I have to think about that for a minute. Um, they've all had their own challenges, I think. Um, one, of the, one of the problems, um, structural work, as we call it, that is fixing dealing with canvas distortions and paint cleavage and, and tears, things like that. That's structural work. And structural work is always difficult because you're trying to do as little as possible because you don't want to overly influence the original materials of the painting. But you also have to effectively 
treat the problem, whatever that is. And those can be the most challenging to tell you the truth. Um, it, it gets a little bit too much into the nuts and bolts, but paint um, varies a lot from time to time and age to age and brand to brand and artist to artist and even color to color. And so when you have, as I described in this painting, where you have cracks, you have little islands of paint that start curling up from age, um, there's always the uh, um, feeling that we want to flatten those paint flakes back out, that this was, that, that we want to get that reverse time, so to speak, and flatten those paint uh, flakes out so that the painting looks closer to what it did originally. In some cases, we can do that. Uh, it's very dicey though, because we have to use heat and pressure and the correct adhesives and the correct way to apply the adhesive, adhesive all sorts of variables like that. And I'd say some of the most difficult treatments that I've had on various paintings, particularly Gary's paintings, is that his paints tend to be very hard. They don't react easily uh, to being flattened out. And so there's always the kind of feeling that you want to take it farther, that you want to push it a little bit farther. And that I think if I ever had a problem with the paintings, it was fighting myself and not taking it farther because um, uh, it's, it, you can damage a painting irreversibly. Um, paintings tend to be restored, no one marks a calendar, but pa paintings tend to be restored once every 100 years, 75 years, something like that. And it's, it happens because the paintings change hands. They're inherited, they're bought, uh, different things happen, the, the artwork changes hands, and then someone wants to fix it, they want to improve it. So they wanna clean it, or they wanna put it in a different frame, various different things like that. So with Gary's paintings, that was one of my points is that that's, this hasn't happened. These paintings have always been in one place for the most part and very little restoration has been done to them. But I oftentimes see paintings that are 100 or 200 years old that have been restored three or four times before they've gotten to me. And every one of those restorations, there's the potential to push the restoration too far and to cause damage as part of the restoration. And so, um, uh, it, that, that's that's the 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 edge that a conservator walks on. You want to try to treat a problem, but you don't want to go over the edge and actually cause damage. Mm -hmm. And so that, that that that's the most challenging thing about conservation in general. And really, with Gary's paintings, are no different from every other painting. They they have those challenges built into them. So we have a, a question. Um, this person owns um, an eighteenth or early 19th century landscape oil, um, not by anyone famous, they think. Um, <laughs> evidently it's, <laughs> it's quite dark and has never been cleaned. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Where would this person go to find a conservator to assess whether it is worth cleaning or not? Sure, well, that's, that's, that might be two different questions. So I'll answer it in two different ways. Uh, one is, is that, is it worth cleaning? Well, worth is, um, has many layers. Oftentimes when someone says worth, the first thing that pops into our mind is monetary worth. And that's certainly important. It's important in, in, in most cases. But um, a lot of the artworks, every artwork out there has other, other levels of worth. There's personal worth, there's family worth, there's historical worth, uh, decorative worth. There's all these other levels that make an artwork uh, useful or, or interesting or worthwhile, if you wanna put it that way. And I, you know, looking back, I would say that um, probably 85% of the paintings that I treated, whether, when I was in private practice in particular, uh, the, the amount of money that I charged to do that restoration exceeded the monetary value of the artwork. And so um, when you, you ask if something is worthwhile or not, um, that's what you have to think about. What, you know, what, what's, what's your investment in the painting? Is it purely monetary or is it family history? Is it historical history? Is it, you know, there's lots of things to think about in that respect. Uh, the other uh, caveat on that is that the uh, conservator should never be telling you what your painting is worth or what your artwork is worth. We do not appraise artwork. It's a conflict of interest. And it's obvious, if I told you your artwork was worth a million dollars, then paying me 10,000 to fix it would sound like a good deal. But if it's not worth a million dollars, if it's worth 5,000 and I'm gonna charge you 10,000, well, that's a different story altogether. So you sh uh, the restorer conservator should not be appraising your artwork. That's a different deal altogether. Um, 
And then what was the other level? Oh, okay, as far as finding a conservator, that's much easier to, to do. <laughs> uh, and I would direct anybody, not just this one person, but anybody that has any kind of important artifact that they wanna take care of to look up the American Institute for Conservation, that's AIC. And this is a na nationwide organization of professional conservators. And you can go to their website. The website address is culturalheritage.org. And on their website, you will see a tab that says find a conservator. And you go to that page and you can plug in your zip code, how far you're willing to go, and then what kind of conservator you need. For this person in particular, it'd be a paintings conservator. But you might choose a paper conservator or an objects conservator. There are quite a few different types. And uh, push, push the button and it will generate a list of conservators in your geographical area that you can contact about uh, your artwork. That's pretty straightforward. It's nice just to go to one source to find what it you is. need. It is, one-stop shopping, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for those of us who, who might own artwork, how, do you have any uh, tips or guidelines on how we should be taking care? Because obviously we don't have the resources or the, you know, the uh, environmental controls that a museum has. How should we be taking care of our artwork? Sure. Well, I, I guess in, uh, on a personal level, uh, uh, I, I feel the same way in my house. I rarely have the conditions that I would have in my museum to take care of my artwork. Uh, none of us do. So um, the main things to be concerned about are the things that affect a, an artwork in the long term, and that is temperature, humidity, and light. So anything that you have that you treasure should not be in direct light. It should not be in direct sunlight. Sunlight, uh, strong sunlight, bleaches and fades things and ages things very quickly. Also in the category of light are certain kinds of artificial light, fluorescent light in particular, particularly those long glowing tubes of what we call work fluorescent light. They have a lot of ultraviolet light in their spectrum and they have a very detrimental effect on everything, including your skin and that sort of thing, if, if you happen to have those. But rarely do people have those in their houses, so that's really not that big of a deal. But uh, just to kind of put a head on it, as far as temperature and humidity goes, you don't want things that you treasure in your attic or your basement. Those are generally places that are too hot, too cold, too humid, too dry, uh, those kind of things. And they will have a detrimental effect on your artwork. Um, the second thing is to, uh, don't, um, to put it in a word, don't love your artwork to death. Um, if you have something you really treasure, it's really better just to keep your hands off of it. Um, we're, we're a do-it-yourself culture. A lot of people try to fix things uh, and with, with very little understanding of what they are. To do this kind of restoration work, um, you really have to know what you're doing. You have to have an education. You have to have experience. And so most things I would ask people not to try to fix it themselves. Um, of course, restoration is expensive. It can be expensive to have a professional work on things. But more and more, if you watch Antiques Roadshow, things like that, you discover that the aging process and the patina that, that uh, artworks acquire, that sort of thing, is actually a valued thing. And oftentimes when we think about cleaning something and making it look fresh and new again, we're actually being detrimental to the artwork. We're reducing its value. Uh, so, so jumping to the conclusion that something needs to be cleaning uh, sometimes is going down the wrong path. Uh, the other thing is, is that um, even if you have something that you know is very valuable and you want to take care of it, uh, having it restored over and over and over again is not a good thing. Um, I, I've seen uh, paintings in collections that are 100, 150 years old that have been restored three and four times, and every one of those restorations has taken something away from it. So you really can do too much as far as artworks go. Interesting. Well, I understand that, that part of my introduction was... Um, was truncated somehow during the recording process. So I apologize for that. I'm not exactly sure how much uh, was um, missed, but um, I'm trying to, I had another. Michelle, yes. can, I, can I add one more thing? I, I, I forgot one of my last points. And that is even though uh, professional restoration can be expensive, conservation work can be expensive. Uh, going to the AIC as a source and, uh, and looking up professionals for the object that you have 
you know, go ahead and go through that process if you have an interest, because oftentimes professional conservators are free to consult with. Um, it, you know, if, you, if you're going to take up their time, hours and hours of the time, of course, they're going to charge you. But oftentimes, uh, uh, conservators are very open to speaking to you on the phone for 10, 15, 20 minutes and helping guide you in the direction of, of helping you with your object so you can make better choices. And even if it, it comes out to say uh, they, 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 you actually need to uh, physically consult with them and for them to see your object, well, that might only cost you 100 or $200. And you may be much better off knowing that level of information on your artwork before you dive into something else. You may find that you don't, you're, you're, you're much better off than you thought you were as far as the condition of your object. Mm -hmm. Do you know um, when you go into a project, you know, how, I mean, do you like test a little area to say this is what it's gonna look like when we're finished? So you can kind of maybe on the back or something? Yes, ab absolutely. It, it, it's, it's always objects dependent. I mean, some objects are more, uh, uh, you're able to do that on some objects more than others. But say a painting like Nelson Berry's store. Uh, absolutely, when I'm, when I'm diagnosing the issues and, and trying to figure out what the situation is, I'm doing very small tests on the edges of the painting. Mm -hmm. um, you never go to the center of the painting and you always start with the weakest, uh, uh, smallest intervention and then work up from there to see what's actually going to have the effect that you want it to have. So you can sneak up on these things. And if you, if you take your artwork to a professional, they're going to do the same thing. You're going to stand back and you're going to talk about it. And then they're going to ask you if, you, if you want to go to that point, they're going to ask you permission to do a little tiny test here and there to have a better understanding of what things are. And then if, if it gets to the point that you actually agree that you want to uh, have the conservator work on the piece, then they should be giving you a written estimate right up front it gives you a very good idea of how the artwork's gonna change, but also what it's gonna cost you. Uh, the, these aren't, are not, they're not, you, ca you can't always nail things down 100%, but you should definitely be in the ballpark and a ballpark understanding of how the artwork's going to change and what it's gonna cost you. Very interesting. Well, it looks like we've taken care of all of our questions unless anyone wants to jump in here real quick. Um, that was interesting, Perry, thank you. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. Um, talking about, we love Nelson Berry's store here at Belmont. <laughs> it's one of our favorites, <laughs> one of our favorites, mostly because, well, at least for me, because you can, you can see it. You can see the building from Belmont and it just gives it such a, a wonderful sense of place. Um, it's very special to us. So um, if you want to share this program uh, with someone, it should be available on our YouTube channel, hopefully, um, the next few days. And we have a second presentation with Perry already scheduled, um, and that is March 25th. And you can find that information on our website, garymelchers.org, um, or on our Facebook page. And, and then we're in the process of planning for a third program. So we're really excited about that and very thankful to Perry for um, sharing his time and expertise with us. So uh, thanks to everyone and we'll see you soon.